Uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, these guys from Social Actions. Uh, this is Peter Dietz and this is Christine Egger. Hello. And they've been working on some interesting uh, microphilanthropy and web people and all kind of stuff that I thought you guys would find interesting. So why don't you guys take it away? Great. Thanks. Peter first. Thank you, Heskey, and thank you, Google, for having us uh, over to share our open source initiative. Uh, and I anticipate there'll be a fair amount of synergies between stuff you're working on and perhaps some of the work we're doing. Um, I'm going to, um, Christine, you want to load up socialactions.com? Uh, meet the platforms, please. Um, so my name is Peter Dietz. I'm the founder of Social Actions. For the last six months, I've also been serving as the project lead. Prior to six months ago, Social Actions was just up here. So there was no project lead. There were no volunteers. There was nothing happening all that much. So as of six months ago, we, we received some awards. We got some attention in the nonprofit tech uh, community. And as a result, we've been moving forward fast with our effort to aggregate peer-to-peer -peer social change campaigns as well as micro-philanthropy campaigns. A little bit of background. I um, studied history at university. I have an undergraduate master's degree in history, but I've always sort of been very involved in the technology sector, the technology community. For the last five years, I've worked uh, exclusively in nonprofit technology. And, um, <clears throat> and for the last two years, I've been particularly interested in how microphilanthropy can play a role in bringing about large scale change in societies, communities we live in and belong to, feel attachments to. Um, social Actions, is a, its mission is to connect individuals with opportunities to take action. And I guess I should define what I mean by that, define what taking action would mean in this case, and define, of course, what microphilanthropy means. So, Microphilanthropy, as our working definition is, any small scale activity or gesture that carries with it some intent to do good and has the effect of transforming communities um, for the better. And uh, it's microphilanthropy that we're talking about in two cents. Micro because we're dealing with very small gestures, whether they're monetary or non-monetary. And it's also micro in the sense that it's facilitated by technology, the social networks we use every day, blogs, open source software, and of course, the good old email. Um, what's emerged in the last two years is truly a sector, a kind of micro philanthropic sector composed of websites um, and platforms that facilitate this small scale uh, micro philanthropic activity. Some of the sites that we're talking about deal exclusively with donations. Others have to do with entirely non-monetary actions like signing a pledge or joining an offline event or simply um, lending your support, expertise, and resources for some specific goal or in support of a specific cause. Now, if we think of each of the platforms that have emerged in the last two to three years um, as individual fountains um, pouring out these opportunities to take action, some of which are created by individuals, some of which are created by nonprofits. They just sort of are out there, and you have to know about the fountain, you have to know about the platform if you want to get involved, if you want to take up that invitation to, um, to be part of this movement. What Social Actions attempts to do is remove the need for you going to one of these social action platforms, as we call them, and instead um, connecting you directly wherever you are on the web with an opportunity to be microphilanthropic, to make a small donation or to sign a petition or to pledge to attend an event or an offline meetup. <clears throat> and we're doing that through first aggregation of actionable opportunities. We've set up a simple RSS-based aggregation um, using Ruby on Rails. And we've created, on top of that, a search interface that allows you to search across platforms. And we've opened up this data set via an open API so that any third party developer can create something really cool with this data set and, in so doing, connect people with opportunities to take action. Um, <clears throat> So I, uh, we're going to get into some details. Christine, my colleague here, is going to present an overview of the microphilanthropy sector. And then I'm going to share with you some more of uh, the technical challenges we've come across in building out this open source repository of actionable opportunities. 
Um, I'll mention that we have a Google group that facilitates a lot of the organizing around this project. We have a Ning blog with 200 members. We've been written up recently in a number of uh, leading philanthropy and nonprofit technology blogs. We've also appeared in the <clears throat> Wall Street Journal, the Daily Telegraph, and the Chronicle of Philanthropy. And we've been the recipient of several awards, the third place finish in the Net Squared Mashup Challenge, and a finalist in the, Case in the Stockholm Challenge, a winner of the Case Foundation Donate Now Challenge, and help me out here, a recipient of a $25,000 grant from the Puri Foundation out in the Bay Area. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Christine, who's going to give an overview of the, of the microphilanthropy sector. I'll mention, though, last point, that we would love and to extend an invitation to each of you as individuals to both get involved in this project, to, to consider yourself potential microphilanthropists that make use of these, of these platforms, um, but also partners in our effort to create this infrastructure that will help microphilanthropy fulfill its promise. Hi, as Peter um, said, I'm Christine Egger, and I get to be formally involved with this project uh, in the near term as platform liaison, and I'll explain briefly what that means. Um, I got to know about social actions and became a fanatic fan of it uh, just last fall when I found Peter's blog and joined the Google group at that time, so I've been informally involved for quite a while as this thing has been ramping up. Um, the reason that I'm so passionate about microphilanthropy and what's being done in this sector stems from a, an experience I had a couple of years ago creating a campaign on Give Meaning, which is one of the uh, platforms that we aggregate from. Um, someone passed me an online article, an interview of a boy in Nepal who um, had been out of school since he was 12 years old, taking care of his family, and a bunch of people posting comments to that said, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could do something about that and help him get back to school? And I said, okay, well, let's believe we could make that happen. We've got the technology available. And it was very challenging and um, continues to have challenges, although it's rewarding, too, because he's back in school. Um, but a site like Give Meaning made that experience much easier than it ever could have been without it to collect all of that, that support. So, so as um, a platform liaison, what I basically do is, is connect with these, these platforms, these websites, encourage them to develop RSS feeds if they haven't already, um, encourage them to collaborate with us and get explicit about what their mission is and what our mission is and where we overlap, and also um, and, and, and encourage them to think of, of their contribution as um, contributing to more than just each platform separately. They are, there actually is a sector emerging. <laughs> A micro philanthropy and and the platforms are just beginning to discover what the benefits could be of collaborating amongst themselves so the sector what is what is it it's online um, giving and receiving of gestures of actions of compassion one one to another uh, def our definition of philanthropy millions of dollars being funneled through these sites five to ten dollars at a time millions of volunteer hours being distributed one to two hours at a time We've identified already about 80 websites that are creating these opportunities to take action in this way. Many of them are very big. First Giving alone is responsible for about $50 million worth of donations funneling through to nonprofits. Volunteer Match, three and a half million um, volunteer connections. But many are, are emerging, many are just, um, just starting up. So, oh, I shouldn't have turn, turned back. I lost my train of thought. So, so I'm going to describe three of those platforms in some just very briefly, a little bit of detail to give you a sense of the diversity and the incredible variety of the kinds of actions that are taking place within that umbrella that we're calling platforms. And then um, go into some detail and then describe why we believe, why I believe very strongly that this is more than just breaking down philanthropy into small pieces and moving it online. What we're describing, we think, is an infrastructure that's fundamentally different and that changes, changes the way that philanthropy is going to, is taking place. So three quick examples. One um, I really love is a group right here in New York called Modest Needs. And they help anyone who is making ends meet. They're not on public assistance. Uh, they may be living paycheck to paycheck. They get hit with an unexpected expense and um, reach out to Modest Needs, fill out an application, and ask for help in handling that expense. And anybody visiting that website can search through these vetted applications and decide to, that they want to contribute to helping that, that person out. So one recent story, a gentleman lost a foot. The medical expenses were paid for, but he needed to adjust the pedals on his car so he could continue to drive to work. 
not risk losing his job, put that application on modest needs, and, and the donors collectively decided to cover that for him. A second very different type of website, should I speak a little sl more slowly? <laughs> Being platform liaison helps me get over my fear of public speaking, <laughs> so I'll get better at that in route. Um, a second one, uh, thepoint.com, very different group. The Point is out of Chicago. They help, they give anybody an opportunity to um, raise funds or sign a petition or start a, start a campaign to enable people to take action, the difference being that if a pledge or any kind of fundraising campaign is started on the point, nobody puts in an actual dollar, nobody actually does anything until there's enough collaboration, enough participation to reach a tipping point. So if you might be reluctant to actually put your money in, not knowing if enough money is going to be pulled together to have the impact that you want, the point removes that reluctance and uh, gives people a chance to, um, to move forward and make, make a difference. David Cohn, who's active in citizen-led journalism, used the point to get over 100 people to, to give $2,500 altogether to hire reporters to fact check political campaigns, political advertisements in the, in the election coming up in San Francisco. So he put that out there, a couple hundred people um, in the aggregate put in 2,500 bucks and the tipping point was reached and those reporters are now being hired. Which is pretty cool, it wouldn't have happened otherwise. And a third um, platform, very different from the first two, is Nabur, and that is Dutch for neighbor. This is a group that comes out of the Netherlands. They connect online volunteers to um, projects going on in villages in Africa. And um, one example, a, a, a group recently decided to start a dairy farm project because they needed some income in the village and they needed some more protein. And they tapped in, the, com the community tapped into online volunteers from Hong Kong, Australia, um, UK, uh, South Africa for help in deciding which livestock to use when they decided on goats, which breeds to use. Um, and now they're, they're tapping into that online volunteer pool to help with their training materials. Um, and so the village guides that process and Nabur allows volunteers to tap into the project as it moves, as it moves forward and evolves. So why is this different than big money, top-down, programmed philanthropic assistance? Um, I really think that that what we've got here is we're building an infrastructure that reflects, it, it's, got a, it's got a design and a system that reflects the society that we live in more than top-down, pre-programmed, um, long-term projects would. That's a very Newtonian mechanistic model. And if we draw from chaos theory and quantum theory and some other ideas that excite me and might be familiar to this group as well, um, we want to design an infrastructure that reflects the nonlinear relationships we have in a society and with each other as we participate in these philanthropic gestures. And three characteristics come to mind of a system that would reflect this nonlinear, um, the nonlinear dynamics that we're actually engaged in when we reach out to help one another. And those would be lots and lots of feedback, lots and lots of um, points of entry, participation, and, and the ability to, as you participate, change your role um, reflexively and adaptively as you engage. So examples on lots of participation, we have a decentralized system here with thousands of points of entry to either give or receive or learn or put in your funds or your insights, whatever you have to contribute and gain from this sector. Uh, and um, Nabur, is, a, is a, the project that I mentioned from Nabur is a great example of that. Um, and and the, the ability to, um, <laughs> just lost my train of thought, the second, <laughs> so there's participation many points and, many points, and many points of entry and being able to switch hats. So one moment we might find a campaign that we'd love to volunteer for, another we decide that we want to fundraise for um, or we want to collect funds for. Um, and we want to be able to switch hats as we step in and out of these opportunities to be philanthropic. And Modest Needs is a great example of that. 65% of the people who approach Modest Needs and fill out applications asking for help on their website become future donors in the, in, on Modest Needs. So they make it really easy for people to respond to their situations as it, as it changes. Um, so we really do believe that this represents an infrastructure that's developing, that's massively scalable, phenomenally decentralized, and represents a very different system, a different way to engage in the sector. Um, than we've seen before. 
that requires, um, that rec this infrastructure requires some technological development. And I'm going to pass it back over to Peter, who's going to talk about how you actually build this um, big easy button that we're, uh, that, we're, that we're constructing here. The process that we've um, been, been adopting for creating this infrastructure for microphilanthropy is equally decentralized um, and hopefully equally scalable to the infrastructure um, that, that Christine was, was, was discussing. Um, I want to um, kind of restate what Social Actions does, provide an example of one of the web applications that have been built using our API, and then sort of put out there some of the challenges that we've come across in really providing an API that contains and disseminates, syndicates actionable, opportuni ap actionable opportunities, but with all of the context and meaning and um, rich information that a potential action taker would want to have on hand when they're making that decision on whether or not to be philanthropic at that moment. So social actions, stated very simply, connects individuals with these opportunities to take action. Uh, we've aggregated the, the micro-philanthropy campaigns from, at this point, 25 uh, platform partners. That number is going to go up to 28 at the end of this week. And we expect that with time, as news of our open source repository of actionable opportunities grows or expands, more and more micro-philanthropic platforms will find us and plug into our, our data set. So the data set is out there. It's in the public domain. It's free to add actions to the platform. It's free, of course, to search the platform. And all of the web applications that get built and syndicate these actionable opportunities won't pay any sort of licensing fee or need, or there will, have, there will be no need to create friction between the developers creating those applications and the applications that they've, they've just built. Um, <clears throat> so in its current form, our API aggregates some very basic information. We're using RSS, as I mentioned earlier. And so what we can pull in right now is the title of the campaign, the a little description, um, a link to where the campaign resides, Obviously, we know the platform that created it because it's produced the RSS feed. Um, and we have the date that the action was created. Um, that's great. And you can do a lot with that information in the aggregate. Um, we consider that a huge accomplishment just to have approached these 25 platforms, encouraged them to create the RSS feed, and succeeded in building out this open source system that aggregates and then syndicates actionable opportunities. Um, with the open API as it currently stands, um, by the way, I'll point out it was developed by a worker-owned cooperative up in Br Brattleboro, Vermont, called the Brattleboro Tech Collective. Um, they've just done a phenomenal job putting this together. Um, the search method itself is Sphinx, for any of the developers in the room, and that is a really quick way of searching across a large data set for a keyword and pulling up the, the, the matches. The, so what we've done with the API in its current form is develop a widget called Related Ways to Take Action. And this widget is actually inspired by the work of Google. So thank you for having inspired us in this regard. Our widget um, uh, uh, can be placed on any web page, in any, on any blog, in any context on the web. And it identifies the three most relevant keywords from that web page that represent the content of the page. And then it makes a query to our API and pulls back the three actions that Sphinx has determined match that keyword. Um, I can do a, a little run through after the presentation if anyone's curious. So if we take an example of our widget being put on a website like Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch has a lot of articles about human rights abuses around the world. For each of those stories, um, our widget would present three, at first, three actions that someone can take. If you're not inspired by them, you click the More button. You get three more actions, all from different platform partners participating in our system. And then hopefully one of the nine, because you go through three screens, would inspire you. And you can just go straight to the platform and take the action required. The goal is to catch, the, catch people, to catch potential action takers at that moment that they're most inspired, that they're most revved up, and really want to affect some change on the, uh, in regard to the content that they're consuming online. So, yes? Would you mind giving us a quick example? Quick example? OK, sure. I'll, I'll use the, um, let me give you two examples. First, 
let's have a look at our search interface. So if we type in Burma, for example, um, there was enormous storm in Burma a few months back. In the last week, there's been one action created that uh, is asking for volunteers uh, in, 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 in Burma. And it comes to us via idealist.org. If we change the um, search query to show me all actions re referring to Burma created any time, um, we get 19 actions from Global Giving, which is one of our micro philanthropy partners that focuses on donations to international development projects. We get a petition from CARE2, and the volunteer opportunity from idealist.org, a, uh, a fundraising campaign from Bring Light, and some actions from change.org, Give Meaning, and a few others. So that's the example of our search interface in action. We don't think that every morning millions of people are going to come to our website and search for opportunities to take action. When that happens, wonderful. But until it happens, this API that I was describing will connect and move those actions to where people are already. Can you pick up by location or type of uh, contribution? Sure. Sure. Audience? Yeah, the question was, can you sort by more advanced information than just keyword. So if you go to our search and click, click advanced query, advanced search, you get this um, interface. We've listed all of the platform partners and you can check or uncheck what you're looking for, which platforms you want to search. You can uh, use this pull down menu to bring up the kinds of actions you want to search for. Right now it's just you can select one, but we'll, we'll change that in the coming weeks. So say you're looking for um, volunteer opportunities. Um, created in the last 14 days from all of our platforms, you could go for that. Your question was regarding location, right? Yeah, because, I mean, so if it's in Africa, unless I mm -hmm. take the plane and go there, <laughs> and the <laughs> Right. If, if it... it uh, so some, some people, they want to mm -hmm. give time, mm -hmm. give money, so... Exactly, yeah. If you're not in Africa, but you want to volunteer, you'd go to a site like Nabur. If you're not in Africa, but you want to affect change, you would be looking up uh, fundraising campaigns that you contrib contribute to or local events in your community that lend support to a community in Africa. Um, it's a good segue to the microphone. It's a very good segue for where we're headed with the API, but I do want to present um, the related ways to take action just really quickly um, because there was a, a request for that. So we've created, again, inspired by Google, Social Actions Labs, which is our kind of incubator for these web applications that draw on the API. And here's uh, the related ways to take action. So there's the form. Let me go quickly to HRW. Here's an article on trialed soldiers. And this is a live demo. If it doesn't work, uh, I apologize. But I'm pretty confident in Eric Cooper and Joe Solomon's abilities. They are the two uh, individuals who built this widget for us. Um, so you, say your website is HRW. If you want to get a sense of what actions would be presented when you, if you put that widget on your site, you'd put in the URL that you're adding the widget to. You click this button that says Create Widget. And here is um, the name of the title of the page you've, you've looked up. In this case, US Congress Acts to Prosecute <coughs> Recruiters of Child Soldiers. Um, and here are some actionable opportunities. First, African United Partnerships Prevent Spread, I'm not sure what. Uh, care to petitions, um, child education, the fight against something, care to some more petitions. The if you go to th the mouse over has to be <coughs> full text. Mm -hmm. That's again, Eric Cooper's uh, brilliant development in in action. The third screen includes this more button, and that's where you would find out actually what keywords were found for that particular page. And in this case, it's soldiers united and child. So we've done a query against this uh, Ruby on Rails system. It's brought back these nine. And if you want to see more results, you click the More button, and it takes you to the Social Actions page, beginning with search result number 11. And it's found 2,064 total actions that fit that um, query. So if you can imagine this sort of application that we've built with just the very limited data set of title, platform, type of action, and link, you can begin to think, well, what would be possible if our API included a lot more rich information? 
about actions. What would it look like if there was a microformat that the platforms could use to send us uh, up-to-date information about each of their actions? And, well, it just turns out we're developing a microformat that would help platforms send over information to us with the latest information about their actions. And then our API would be able to push that out in real time to all of the web applications that are expecting that kind of, of information. Um, <clears throat> let me take a quick sip of water, and I'll, then I'll go into some of the data points that we've identified common to virtually all microphilanthropic opportunities. So, so you're focusing on the findability of you know, the good action of good deeds. So do you think this is really the bottleneck, finding you know, what to do? Because afterwards, you, know, you need to uh, basically understand better. You need to choose. Uh, maybe you need to authenticate to provide some information. Then there is a payment mechanism. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned maybe some escrowing to make sure that you reach a tipping point before you know, everybody can contribute. So, are you sure that finding is the bottleneck? Or? You're, you're, you're setting me up for all of my segues, so thank right. you. That's great. <laughs> let, me, let me finish with this uh, microformat example, and then we'll go into sorting and filtering this enormous data set, because obviously that's the holy grail of this whole thing. Yes. What, what do you actually mean by microformat? Sure. Um, you might be catching me uh, on that. When I say microformat, I'm really just referring to a universal data standard for moving around these actionable opportunities. Is I'm, like XML or HTML markers? Sure, or what? sure. So. There's different kinds. The. It's, uh, it's uh, HTML with some span tags and you specify a specific class no, no, name. No, 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 no. That's, what, that's what we think is a microformat. I'm asking mm. what he thinks ah. is a microformat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Great. So, really, what I should be saying instead of microformat right. is a universal schema for referring to actual opportunities. And how you package that data uh, determines whether it's an XML feed or a microformat in the microformats.org style or whether it's uh, an API connection. JSON is the format for API connections that we're most familiar with. So um, in this sense, it would, we plan to embed a microformats.org style microformat in all of the search results. So if for any reason your browser is able to identify the presence of an action, it could do something with that microformat because it's been embedded in the HTML with the span tags and all that. Um, but more important, before we get to the microformat structure, we need to know what's in the microformat. And that's where the conversation is right now with between social actions and our platform partners and also among the platforms in, independently. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as an aggregation tool, we want to be able to pull in as much information about the actions and have it be up to date as possible. The platforms are just coming to that realization as well. It would be great if we could syndicate this stuff. So what we've created actually is a Google Doc that lists all of the uh, fields from the donorschoose.org open API and then maps that to a more generalized schema for action microphilanthropic opportunities in general. And then we've added on a few fields that aren't necessarily um, relevant to the donorschoose.org model because it's dealing exclusively with classroom projects and moving money to the teachers who have brilliant ideas for classroom projects. Um, the fields that we're discussing here, there are about two dozen of them. Some of them relate to the context of the action, um, what it's about, what's the name of the nonprofit that's implementing it or serving as a conduit, where is it, the action going to happen, so some kind of geolocation of either the person who created the action, where the action happens, what's the expected impacted area, geographically speaking, for that action, and then other things, crucially, the expiry date for the action. When's the last date you can sign on to that action or contribute if it's a fundraiser? Um, and that's one kind of collection or category of the fields we want to embed in this microformat or universal schema for microphilanthropic campaigns. The second category of fields has to do with the progress of that campaign to date. So it's about the feedback that's been generated in relationship to that action. And in this case, it would be like, how many people have signed on to this action? How many people have donated if it's a, if it's a uh, fundraiser? Um, and then social actions will add, and have there been any pictures generated from the action? So potential action takers can see the event unfolding in real time. Social actions will add to that 
information, its own metadata, like how many times has this action been clicked through as a result of our API, or how many in unique websites refer to that action. And we can use that information to help filter. So let me conclude with some thoughts on filtering and sorting our data set, and then we'll open it up to questions. I'm really looking forward to absolutely the toughest questions you have for us, uh, and any insights on how we could be making this better. So filtering and sorting is kind of the, the most difficult thing. I mentioned at the beginning that each of these platforms is kind of like a fountain, um, uh, whatever the verb is, uh, distributing actionable opportunities. The last thing we want to do on the social action side is turn those fountains on their side and kind of create a giant fire hose that overwhelms action, potential action takers with opportunities to get involved. We want to be connecting individuals with the actions that are most relevant to their particular disposition, their um, a theory of change, their um, ability to engage with an actionable opportunity at that moment. So <clears throat> for the, 12, the two dozen fields or data points that I described in the microformat that we're developing, that's gonna, those data points are going to be critical for providing much more meaningful filtering of the data set as a whole. If someone is interested in being that last person who makes an action happen or ha makes a campaign on the, the point tip, we can create a web application that says uh, just-in-time actionable opportunities. And it lists only petitions or fundraisers that are about to reach their fundraising goal, never mind um, you know, actions that might not get that far. On the other hand, there might be people who really want to be that first person who says, this is a great idea, let's run with it. And we can create a web application from the data in the API um, connecting individuals with actions that have just now been created. And if you fill out some information about the kinds of actions you're looking for, social actions or this web application that's been created, will notify you immediately via mobile phone or email or via social network of this opportunity that's just come up. So you can think about the filtering and sorting possibilities. They're really endless. I'll conclude by saying that, or reiterating what Christine said, which is we are in the process of creating an open source um, repository of actionable opportunities. We want it to be massively scalable. We want it to be decentralized. And we want to create as many entry points into microphilanthropy as possible. Where are we based? We're virtual. <laughs> We're virtual. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm based in Montreal. Um, from, I'm from New York originally. Christine's in Michigan. Uh, our developer is in, our developers, well, some of them are in Brattleboro. Some of them are wandering. And, Vancouver. and one, uh, one, one fellow, uh, Joe Solomon, is, is based in, in Vancouver. How did you get here? How did we end up here? In New York in this room. I can help with that. Yeah. So a, a while ago, um, so I'm involved in a charity that I started uh, with uh, many years ago, which provides uh, scholarships for kids in Nepal. And uh, a while ago, there was an article in um, Yahoo Hot Zone, yeah, that, uh, where they talked about uh, meeting this kid in Nepal who was supporting his family by parking motorcycles in Kathmandu. And it got this response where people said, oh, we should, uh, <laughs> thanks. We should help this kid out, but that's that's very difficult. First of all, just finding him again. I mean, the reporter found him, but then you, you know to find him again and and get him enrolled, and God knows what the difficulties are and why he's where he is. But it got enough interest, and Christine had enough energy to actually get something started, and she approached our organization to see if we could help. And because of the type of project it was, um, we didn't we don't usually do something like that. But some of the people in the organization, specifically our uh, president, thought he would like to help, and so. This, that project got started and to date has been quite successful uh, and is an interesting example uh, of philanthropy. Uh, and that's how I have started learn I learned about social actions and I thought that would be interesting to present here. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. I'm curious as well, when you talk about putting together a schema for the actions of 
Okay, these action opportunities or whatever you call them. Um, there, I mean, if, if one goes down the road of developing schemas in, in the area of nonprofits, that's only one of many schemas that probably should exist. I mean, for instance, one thing that you're probably going to refer to, but you probably won't have a lot of, uh, you, you probably won't go into it in great depth, would be just the description of the nonprofit itself. Your focus is on describing the action as opposed to describing the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of nonprofits, for instance, that might not have these specific sort of actions, but just have general needs, you know, like they need a couple hundred tons of wheat or something like that. And so I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably out of your scope as well, because that's like big time philanthropy as opposed to maybe micro philanthropy or whatever. Um, but there is, uh, there, there are, if, if one thinks that developing schemas is a good thing, and by the way, I do think they're good, and I'm actually working on a project which is, which is doing that. Um, are there any, uh, what one would, one would think that this really should be sort of a sub schema of something much larger. Um, are you, uh, are you aware of any other schema projects that you're working with or, uh, uh, other people who are taking the same approach, but maybe from different angles? Um, <clears throat> as far as, as far as we know, uh, social actions is the only effort to create a micro philanthropic schema. Um, some of our platforms or, have, or any kind of philanthropic schema, or any kind of philanthropic schema. There are uh, some other examples, though. Um, for well, I should mention a subset of our platforms have entered into conversations on their own about how to share data, uh, and those are all projects that have received funding from the Omidyar network. Um, that's an aside. There are other efforts within nonprofit technology uh, to create universal schemas, and one example is the H Grant um, initiative. And that's a, an effort f to enable foundations to syndicate and publish what their grant opportunities are at the moment, and therefore kind of bypass the very expensive um, infrastructure and databases that have been created and called over time, representing what foundations fund. If this H grant were to become popular, and I believe it is uh, gaining some traction, then nonprofits or grant seekers could, excuse me, immediately connect with those opportunities to seek the macro kind of philanthropic support that you were discussing. Um, so what could Google do for you? Like if there were one product or feature that you, know, you would want us to create, what would that be? What, what would be most helpful? Oh, I don't speak tech. That's your. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Google would probably offer uh, quite a bit more than tech. But um, I, I would start there, actually. Um, the, the, the resource pool that's represented in the Google employees um, between the ears is, 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 is probably your most um, valuable asset as far as our open source grassroots initiative is concerned. So we would love to see Google employees given the opportunity to lend some support, perhaps one hour a week or one day a week. Well, they probably won't give you a day. But to, to, to help us work through some of these challenges. I just remembered I completely left out the issues of creating an open API uh, and, and encapsulating meaningful data that uh, is incredibly sub, sub, uh, qualitative or difficult to, to, to pack into an automated system. So if a Google employee can enlighten us on how to seamlessly identify the cause area of a microphilanthropic campaign uh, in a really reflexive way that reflects the changes of a campaign over time, maybe it started off being environmental, but uh, with, within a few weeks, it quickly shifted to um, something to do with uh, p poverty uh, or education, or maybe it covers all three cause areas. We need help in developing that system. There are other things, that, um, for example, how would we identify the activist-ness of an action? Some people will be very put off by actions that are too radical or too conservative or too religious. So we want to be able to layer onto our data set that ability to pull out the actions that fit a certain profile of an individual. So those sorts of big, tough questions, I think some Google uh, brains would be able to help us with. And you would be joining in a conversation that's already out there, a community that's wrestling with these, thing, with these questions, and you'd be uh, helping us in, in resolving them.
Is it, it picking it all up? Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll speak okay. loud. Um, so I just wanted to participate and listen in more than anything, but I assume you know about Google Grants and are using Google Grants already? No. No. Are, are you a 501c3 you? organization? We are not. Okay. Well, we we. We're, we're, mo we're moving towards a 501c3 status. Um, what we're looking for right now is a, a fiscal sponsor that could provide the legal infrastructure for being able to apply for things like the Google Grants. But yes, we are familiar with Google Grants. Um, I can give you my information after if you decide that you are, mm. once you get to the point where you can pursue a Google Grant. Can you sure. Answer any questions around that? I know some of the participating platforms mm -hmm. are Google grantees already. Oh, great. But, but also making sure that, you know, that all of those are participating. Mm -hmm. um, sure. That. Great. So, Thank you. When, when you talk about Google Grants, you're talking about the AdSense grant? Yes. So at this point, it's only, I was thinking about AdSense, actually, when you were um, demoing mm -hmm. some of this. But mm -hmm. currently, it's just text ads on Google. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't syndicate any display ads or even text ads onto our partner network mm -hmm. yet. And I don't know the status of any change to that, um, but you know what you were describing looks like AdSense. So maybe nonprofits, mm -hmm. you know, could sign up for you know for and uh, really not receive any payment from Google in association mm -hmm. with placing those ads on their sites, but mm -hmm. perhaps you know foster more awareness about um, related organizations mm -hmm. or ways mm -hmm. that people can take action sure. if it's a site that's more about yeah. education. You know, mm -hmm. but something like that. that um, I don't know if that's in the works, but it may be related to this. You could, you could potentially do something interesting with, uh, if you had a Google AdWords grant, um, then you could use the AdWords section of the search results as your widget mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pick some good keywords and put your put the actions, actions. on there directly. Yep. Yep. We yeah, we've just come from a, a luncheon that we hosted, or we didn't host it because we don't have an office, but we convened. It was hosted by Changing Our World. Um, and and we were talking about this. So how do we move from this data set that exists to and develop a marketing strategy that would actually connect uh, the potential action takers in a big way with this with these opportunities to take action? So far, our focus has been much more decentralized and, and bottom-up. We want developers to create web applications that syndicate uh, the, these opportunities, but I think at the lunch what we arrived at was, well, you know, we really have to go the big guns route, not to use a, a military metaphor, and we need to go the decentralized grassroots route. So I think you'll be looking, you'll be hearing that uh, at some point we, we would be able to do uh, an ad purchase that would help to syndicate these opportunities. Do you know about uh, our app engine? You know, we'll we host sites like this for free mm. and make them completely scalable mm -hmm. if they're built on something called App Engine. App it's Engine. Our hosting mm. service. Your, your hosting service. Is it similar to Amazon's E3 yeah. or E? Uh, not really. No. 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 Okay. It's, it's less general. It's, it's specifically geared towards hosting, hosting. websites yeah. and making them scalable. Oh. Yeah, if if the, you would like Amazon to. Thing is just, you buy mm -hmm. time on a machine. Mm. App Engine is a web server that handles scaling mm -hmm. and stuff like that. For in, on the Amazon thing, if you had a scaling issue, you'd mm -hmm. have to go in and say, well, I need to buy more machines. And that's what sure, right, right, right. It's, it's free up until a point, though. Yeah, but, but that's a pretty big point. Right. It's actually not really. But is mm. it No. But, if, if, but uh, it's, it's dirt cheap mm. once it's not free. If the you grants program yeah, incorporate things are, like this. Aren't we going to do something? We're supposed to we're gonna do something for the nonprofits on App Engine, I thought. Mm. I, I may not be in the loop on that. Courtney Tuckman may yeah. be the best contact mm. for anything integrated with that. And more Google Grants. Sure. If you took the Google Grants, added the Google Checkout without fees for nonprofits, and added in App Engine hosting, mm. you've got the yeah. effect of nonprofit websites. Right, but, well, these, but these guys don't. You, you never take actual money yourself, right? Right, we don't. Which, which? Right, so they wouldn't be able to use the checkout. One, but, they, but he makes a good point. Something you should know mm -hmm. is that at least until the end of the mm -hmm. year, if anybody does any credit card processing, mm -hmm. um, if you're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. Google will give you free credit card processing. And then after the end of the year, assuming that we start charging again, which isn't certain, um, mm -hmm. it'll still be like the cheapest credit card processing right, you can right. get anywhere. So whether or not That's you great. can use it. 
Our you platform partner is good. Yeah, absolutely. The free credit per card processing is like getting a free four or five percent, mm -hmm. anywhere between three mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. five percent sort of free money. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, actually, a question for you. I don't know your name. <laughs> um, App, App Engine, is that what you said it's called? Yeah. Is Prometheus. That, okay. Is that um, listed on the Google um, Information for Nonprofits webpage? I can't remember that. Oh, that's too Because they aggregated a bunch of stuff there mm -hmm. to make it easier for yeah, I've, I'm on that Google group for nonprofits, so I'll check in and I can email you if, if that's available. It's not listed. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make sure I answered the question from the back uh, about regarding um, filtering. Did I feel like, oh, no, no, your question was, is fine, is search the, the valuable? Is, is, the, is there a bottleneck in the first place? Is that, do you yes. feel like we have answered any of that, or do we need to revisit that? No, that's, I mean, okay, so I'm not familiar with uh, the for profit, but I mean, I'm going to take you know, various energy that I can find. And so, so I, I need to find you know, what good deed I can do. Then I, um, I'm going to, so you are an aggregator, so then I'm going to end up on one of these sites. Probably I will have to provide some information about myself. Maybe some uh, credit card information. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe I want to manage multiple projects. So, uh, so this is really complicated because you, mm -hmm. need to, you, you have the problem of single sign-on, so you need mm -hmm. to authenticate, to, you need to remember passwords, you have to mm -hmm. plug in. Mm -hmm. So it's a big mess. And so mm -hmm. I think that for me, the, the dream picture, and mm -hmm. maybe you know, you are just, you know, you know, that's the first step of mm -hmm. finding the, the, right, the right pieces. Mm -hmm. I would like to basically go to your site. I, I need to enter my profile once and only once. And, and basically, I have you know all my projects, all the people I work with, and, mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. And this is the single point of, uh, of access to all my you know good deed, yeah. uh, good deeds persona. Sure. And so, is it you know the, the, the vision that you have, and is it compatible with the, the nature of the of the arena? Because I'm sure that these guys they are all they are, they are willing to find you know good people, but they I'm sure there is. Some kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm, you know, naive and evil and uh, even though I work for Naive and evil. Uh, maybe there are some, there is some turf war and maybe they, they really want to have their own, you know, Africa, this is mine, okay? If you want to go somewhere else. Okay. So, so I don't know if there is, uh, you know, a, a way to play nicely mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in such a system where there is a single point of access. Mm -hmm. You want to take that? Yeah, good. yeah, well, your assumptions are correct. <laughs> there is, um, these platforms, you know, as they learn about each other, they often see themselves as competitive with, with each other. And there are reasons for, for developing a particular niche and saying, you know, we serve this sector extremely well and we should be the go-to platform for, you know, go-to destination site for that kind of action. Um, and so I would say maybe one of our dream scenarios long term would be to have so much, to have those walls come down to the extent that they're comfortable with people using the Social Actions API to access their site and, and perhaps interacting with, with an intermediary that, with the function, with interacting with functionality that doesn't reside on, on that site exclusively. But what do you see at their core business? So, I mean, is it the, the, the finding of the people, the management of the project, the, the control over you know, how the money is spent, the, the management of the volunteers when they go there? It's so it's so different for each one. For those that create opportunities for feedback, um, creating those mechanisms is an absolutely that's an important part of their mission. For some, they don't quite understand that feedback or or they they've limited the de their definition of the life life cycle of a campaign so quickly that it's just reach a fundraising goal and done. No community, no extensive relationship with a campaign leader beyond that moment. For others, they're building huge communities that that track these projects through time, through extended time, with blog and video posts and really a lot of communication back to the donor donor base or the donors. Um, so it really is different for each for each platform and that speaks to the challenge of standardizing the types of information that they could that they could feed to to an aggregator like ours. So yeah, implied or just assumed competitiveness and assumed really unique niches niches here. Mm -hmm. But it, it is we got yeah. another question. It is going. It is giving way to a more collaborative spirit. And mm -hmm. uh, Christine and I and the other people involved in social actions, I would hope, are playing some role in 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 getting those platforms to the point where they see the collaborative opportunities. Yeah. And something like a universal ID for logging in across the platforms would be awesome. Yeah. 
We had just a, this lunch that we just came from was with um, I think we had almost ten platforms that are that are here in the U in New York, eight or ten um, represented. And next week in in Washington, we've got um, almost two dozen coming together. And these are brand new, sit around a table, get to see your peers um, close up and talk about what challenges and opportunities you share. And we're being encouraged to create retreats and workshops and conferences so that more of these conversations can take place. Um, so I actually went through this sort of process of looking for something. I wanted to like tutor math to middle school students in New York. Cool. Um, and I had a really hard time finding something to do. Yeah. Uh, and because, like, I would search and I would search in New York, and it would be like, news articles or whatever, and mm -hmm. stuff that was about, like, from New York newspapers, but about other places, or about, like, Westchester, which I wasn't really willing to go to. And yeah. um, I really had a very hard time finding someplace. And I actually just called up the kindergarten that I went to in New mm -hmm. York. And it, I mean, it was also like a public middle school. And they happened to know of some organization that works in their cafeteria on Saturdays, and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know, it's more of a comment, really drawing on what Arno said earlier, but location is like really important to me. Because I find like a lot of people's demands of me are like, oh, I just want your money and then you can just go. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, like the issues that I care about are much more important to me than that. Right. Um, and I would much rather, like I, I would give of my time and my money, but not really just of my money. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be great if location was a part of this, I think, which yeah. it doesn't seem to be yet. It's not there yet, but it's 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 features large in this universal schema. And um, one of the fields, for example, is will be um, scale scale. What is the scale of this project? Um, if you're looking for local projects, then it, those actions are going to be tagged local, and then they're also going to be getting going to going to be given a zip code or a postal code or some coordinates so that you get a sense of where that is. And then for your search, you can you could. Uh, filter based on your location. Maybe the location filtering happens automatically because it takes some GPS coordinates of where you are at that moment. But. Can you say anything about the process you're going through to define this scheme or how you're doing this? this a lot of times in on the technology side, what we'll do is we'll create a, uh, like a wiki somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. There'll be a mm -hmm. mailing list. Mm -hmm. There's a, you know, a place where we can go and have conversations and people can join in. Is, is there something like that? Yeah. But if I wanted to make comments on your schema tomorrow morning, is, how would I do that? We do. A couple uh, of places. Google, Google uh, features large in that, um, for providing that forum. So um, here's our Google Doc, which um, shows the schema as it's currently conceived. Um, these are the donors choose fields, the fields exposed in the donors choose API. And here are the fields that I proposed for the universal schema. By the way, you see RSSA, it's short for really simple social actions. And that's what we hope this thing will be named. And for lay consumers, they would just be subscribing to action feeds or, or an action well, opportunity. They wouldn't necessarily come across RSSA. In any event, that's Kyle Shannon and um, the Upli uh, in association with the Uplift Academy who thought through this idea of a micro format a few years back. So here are the more generalized fields f um, working from the donors choose example. And then here are the fields I added beyond what donors choose offers that might be relevant to organization uh, to, to our platform partners. Um, and then how you discuss this? Well, let's see, nothing's been posted here because we have a Google group and a blog where that discussion's happening. So a technology committee inside the name to oh, blog. Blog. Social yeah. Actions is where so we're, to your group. yeah, here's the technology committee that um, is working through this question of how to develop a micro format. And here's my post that I updated the, uh, the microformat schema, and I'm linking to the Google Doc. Um, conversations actually are, are distributed a bit too much. So some of these conversations more recently have happened just through phone uh, conference calls, and they haven't been captured, or they've happened in my inbox, and they haven't been captured. Now, can you tell me, you know, you've got, you've got all these, you've got 24 groups you're working with now. Um, that's a tiny slice of all the groups that are doing this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it, like almost everything in, in philanthropy, is phenomenally fragmented. Ridiculous amounts of duplication between the organizations and the rest. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that? Why is that the case? Uh, is it? Uh, I mean, what you know? 
the cynical view is, oh, everybody just likes to do their own thing, and they, they don't want to work with other people. They're having fun on their own. Mm. Uh, the other possibility is that it's just really hard for people to find out about who else is in the space. Um, one thing yep. would be there's just so much opportunity that, in fact, you know, you can create all these little niches, and they, they really should be there. Yep. Of course, one wonders if that, well, anyway. Yeah. What, what's going on here? Why is it such an inefficiently structured uh, segment? I, I think that feeds directly back into my um, um, my statements earlier about this being a reflective of a very nonlinear, chaotic, complex um, environment. And we're all responding to whatever compels us to want to create a solution or create um, a resolution to a problem or a paradox. And we have an opportunity to do that. Um, if we're compelled to create something new, then we've gotten opportunities to do that. Um, so part of it is just that there's there's so much op there's so many opportunities to get involved and so many ways to do that that we're able to respond create something new. It's sort of like when you're watching, um, sort of like seeing you know the evolution of, of economies and merchant systems as opportunities came to actually create profit and um, and and build a build a middle class. Same thing proliferation of philanthropic um, activities and of nonprofits is simply that there's a space created to do that and people are are feeding into it. So I don't know that I don't know that it would be a goal. Like I don't think of all of these platforms and all of this activity as mom and pop shops, mom and pop like video store rentals. That eventually there will be just one or two big blockbuster type, um, you know, top down groups. I don't think that's the goal. I think the goal is to allow the proliferation of really unique niche filling organizations, and then make it manageable to learn what's going on and respond connect with whatever across this entire universe means the most to you. And one of the benefits, one of the most powerful benefits to me of the API is that instead of just looking at one of these platforms, you can search across the entire spectrum, look by keyword or, or issue, whatever it is that you're searching for, and see, boy, there's three very similar projects that are going on in three neighboring villages in this part of Peru, and um, you know, I wonder if they're talking to each other. Or instead of you were looking for an opportunity to volunteer, if you were actually thinking, I, I want to, I want to find some, I want to create a campaign that will bring volunteers to this school. Like I want to raise my hand for that, and tap in and find three or four others, you know, within 10 miles of your zip code that you can go learn from. Um, anyway, so create an infrastructure where you can find out where there's overlaps and inefficiencies, learn from what's working well. Um, so for me, it's not a matter of trying to simplify what's going on out there. Let's just make it manageable. Let's let's not be overwhelmed and confused, but actually be able to respond intelligently to this incredibly diverse field of activity. I don't think we're ever going to minimize that diversity and that heterogeneity. Um, I think it's our challenge to to figure out how to work better with it. Kind of a rambly answer. How would I do? Well, I wanted to comment on that. Yeah. I think it's a really good question. Yeah, it's really a great interesting question. insight because uh, I think any of us have tried to delve into this and encounter this. And that's, that's also what happened when, when we started the organization. We, we, we you know, the, the question comes up, well, well why, why, why would you want to start a new organization? Shouldn't there already be? But yeah. I think almost everything you touched upon is true. It's incredibly hard to find still the other ones that, that, that reflect what you had in mind. Um, people have an idea that they feel is separates them enough from the other ones, like something like a tipping point might have been by somebody who looked at like hundreds of sites or, or organizations that handle donations. They say to themselves, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm going to donate $25 to some cause and it's never going to happen. And they came up with this one thing they felt was so different enough that they, they, they made a methodology of it. And and in some parts of the world, you know, there, there's other things like trust. You know, you don't feel like the, the organizations that exist are, are doing mm -hmm. uh, what you think needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as for the duplication, uh, I think that's something that's really interesting to look into because it seems, at least to me, that there are certain things uh, that could be duplicated at at a loss. So if, if they're duplicated, then then, then you're you know, you're wasting time. Uh, but I think a lot of the other stuff that could be seen as duplication isn't really. So for example, uh, gathering you know anything to do with with finances, uh, that duplication is a complete waste of, of time for any organization. Fundraising uh, purely, you know, just the process of, of transferring money and, and receiving donations. Anything that you can do to offload that to another organization. Would save a lot, but the rest of the stuff, you know, the people on the ground doing whatever it is that the organization is trying to do, seems to, for the most part, be extremely distinct, at least from the things that I've been able to, to observe. 
So I'm not answering your question, but I'm commenting that I've been noticing the same the same thing, and I haven't uh, seen a way which they can be merged. Yeah. So going back to my bottleneck question, so uh, so whenever I take a cab uh, and, I, and I give a tip, sometimes I just say, well, you know, what else are they going to make me different? So you know, I just give them uh, because it's convenient for me. When I go on the web and I find a good piece of software I'm using for free, and I would like to donate, or I go on a website and I would like to have for you know, disaster in China okay, or in uh, I don't know wherever. It's complicated. I need to enter my credit card number. So don't you think that the, uh, a secure micropayment system would really help or mm -hmm. make a big difference? Mm -hmm. um, sure. So you're right that what we've tackled is the distribution layer of scaling up microphilanthropy. But there are other zones or sectors or subsets of this emerging space. And transaction-free... Um, donations is key. Micropayments is key. I've talked to PayPal about uh, what their plans is for micropayments, and they said, well, we can charge you less per, um, we can remove the uh, 25 cent additional fee when you make your payment, but the overall percentage we take is going to be higher. Uh, so that wasn't very helpful. Um, th th we have about four three platforms that we work with, with, with that are the, mic, the payment gateways. So there's Network for Good as a payment gateway. There's Pink Giving, which is a payment gateway that accepts currencies in diff, uh, 33 different currencies. So you sol solve that problem. Um, and they have a lower transaction fee than in the case of Network for Good. Of course, there's PayPal, which is the engine behind certain of these uh, platforms that we presented. And then there's a new one coming out um, called Revolution Money Exchange, which is the new project by uh, Steve Case. And that initiative will allow for um, zero commission um, donations and transfers of money. So I guess what I, what, what I would respond to your question with is it's being done. It's not our niche, but folks are working on micropayments. But do you think that this is the um one of the key bottlenecks? Um, I mean, basically, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Christine? Abby mentioned Abby. that you know, finding the, the right you know, um, item or mm -hmm. the organization to contribute to for him was the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm yeah, going back to the, the, the big, you know, the, um, the, dom the domain of you know, uh, philanthropy. Yeah, mm -hmm. and where are the barriers yes. to enter, right? Yeah, there's, there are, at the moment, uh, various uh, fr points of friction. We've identified the syndication and search as, as one of those points of friction. Another point of friction is how do you actually process the payment and manage the infrastructure. And as Heskey pointed out, you don't want, you don't, there's no need to create multiple infrastructures for that kind of accounting work. Um, and then there are other points of friction, more abstract, um, like the fact that philanthropic opportunities are not in your face um, frequently enough. Instead, we get other kinds of distractions and invitations to, to act in, 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 in other ways. So the, the, the fact is we need resources, we need brains, we need people thinking about how to um, spread philanthropy to encourage micro-philanthropy in particular and to invite individuals um, all around the world to be serious about their role as micro-philanthropists. Thank you.